All right, so we're going to do a quick deck side here on AIP Live. I just want to show you guys, I'm working on something behind the scenes that is pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to create a reusable Python library that's going to make it super easy to do computer vision requests in AIP now. Maybe I'll publish it if, if possible uh, as an AIP library that you can reuse. In AIP now, um, and I wanted to clear up some confusion around what's in Foundry. I think people thought like, oh, Pipeline Builder, there's no way for me as a developer to contribute. What? No, there is an entire online IDE, an entire set of tools for Python developers in Foundry. We're going to, in the next episode, I'm going to walk you through exactly how the computer vision example in AIP now works. The, uh, and also like what these decorators are, what the Foundry API for transforms uh, is. If you're a PySpark programmer, you're gonna pick this up pretty quick. Um, essentially Foundry comes with some included APIs for PySpark that make it easy to define input and output data sets, provide the Spark context for you so you can get a hold of that. And then there's a whole bunch of utilities on top of media sets, which you were abstracted away in the last video on Pipeline Builder. You were seeing the visual UI that lets you interact with those APIs. In here, we're gonna go through the code examples of how you can work with media sets to parse PDFs and scan you know, scan the, the, the text content. And we're also gonna show how you can um, send requests to OpenAI by Base64 encoding the pages in the PDF, which you're seeing an example of here. And then how you can get back a summary of what's in each page from the, um, the model. And we'll also show how we're gonna use that in our SEC filing to extract the structured table content from the document. Now we'll see what kind of a result we get and maybe we'll even um, try bringing in a different model if GPT-4 is not very good at this. But I did want people to know really quickly, full on IDE for doing uh, PySpark programming. You can also build custom Python libraries, which we're gonna do as part of this example. I'm gonna show you how you can build a custom Python library, incorporate it into this transform and all of your transforms in Foundry. Uh, and you can basically, you can also do external transforms, which inter uh, interact with APIs. We're going to walk through an example of that. This is an example of an external transform. We are calling OpenAI. External transforms are typically set up with external system resources. Foundry does come with um, a set of policies for OpenAI that we're going to import. These policies allow communication with APIs. These are egress policies. Um, so just a heads up, you software engineers out there, we're going to do some really cool coding there's absolutely a role for, for hardcore engineers in Foundry, and also you can work locally. Uh, this work locally option here, if you want to work in VS Code or another IDE, you can absolutely check out the repo locally. Just copy the URL, do a git clone, you're in business. And there's also a project called Foundry Dev Tools, which was created by Merck KGAA. I'm going to have the creator, Nicholas, on uh, to talk about as we walk through this project and build it out. Um, but What's cool about Merck and this project they started is it really accelerates Foundry development because you can run transforms locally inside your IDE and you can iterate a lot quicker than you can in the online IDE. Now that said, the online IDE is pretty dang cool. Uh, you can do things like preview uh, data frames, you can run your tests, you can set breakpoints, you can do all kinds of really cool stuff inside the online IDE. You can also run task runners which are going to interact with the build system. So there's a lot you can do in the online IDE, uh, but still a lot of people prefer to work locally because it does greatly speed things up because you're working with a cache of the data in your local environment, which is always going to be faster in some of these online environments. So quick 10,000 foot view of our project. Uh, we are going to finish, um, or I will finish running through the code section probably in tomorrow's video. The next thing I wanted to do real quickly was talk about sales funnels. Um, no one here seems to figure be figured out why it's such a big deal that um, Palantir just released Foundry publicly for the first time ever. Uh, so if we think about a sales funnel, right? Like this is a typical SaaS funnel. At the top of this funnel is typically no one paying, right? This is the free usage tier. And at the top of that funnel, you typically want a good amount of um, software developers, right? Like software developers are sort of the, the bread and butter of a lot of these um, a lot of these platforms, they don't typically pay anything. They typically are, or if they're paying, it's a very small amount. Uh, you can look across AWS, you could look, you know, all the hyperscalers, you'll see this most of the accounts are free or they only spend like less than a thousand dollars a month. Um, you can see this in, in, in companies like Snowflake who publish their cohort metrics. So the top of this funnel, you really want to be devs and free accounts. And then you'll start working your way down the funnel into, um, you know, things like your SMB market, 
All right, so you're gonna get SMB in here. You're gonna get um, large companies, right? So there is a, a, a large cohort as well. Um, and those, those companies might be like, you know, they might have over a thousand employees. And then you'll get the last little sliver is your enterprise funnel, right? So, um, and that's, you know, enterprise typically, these are very large companies. You're talking, um, you know, thousands of employees and they're gonna make up the nice juicy chunk of your revenue for sure. I'm not, and, and I think that this is where Palantir has traditionally played very well. Um, so this would be like enterprise, right? But Palantir has never had any of this, right? So like they basically, they've been basically, this is how Palantir has been competing against their, their, their competitors, right? With like one hand tied behind their back because what happens is small companies enter their devs into this pool. They try it out, they see how it works, and then they'll get on board, right? And even large enterprises often like to pilot this this way where developers will go in and they'll try a product for free or they'll try it out to see how it works and then advocate for it internally. That doesn't necessarily speed up enterprise sales, but it sure as shit speeds up small companies adopting your products as they become big ones, right? And it, there is a, a law around this where you can basically calculate, given the size of this funnel, exactly how many customers entering at the top are going to wind up down here. And again, Palantir to date has essentially been like missing this whole chunk. They really only have gone after enterprise. And they're still going to have their enterprise sales, et cetera, et cetera. But now they get the benefit of the hundreds of thousands of people you can add in at this top and if only one percent of them are converting to enterprise that's still a huge acceleration in growth not to mention uh what this does for the talent pool so like the more developers that learn this and get certified in it the more people you can hire around it the more people will adopt it so this entry level funnel is a huge indicator of adoption and that's a big deal for analysts that's a big deal for people who are evaluating your technology even to consider your technology for use in their organization they want to know there's there's a hiring pool right so this is a big big deal um, i think it's going to help massively accelerate growth now i'm calling these people customers because when you sign up you pay with a credit card right there, you have to put a credit card on file you have to go through an id verification step which includes taking photos of yourself to verify your id matches like it's not like just sign up with an anonymous email and set a username and password you've you absolutely are going to be considered a customer now i think they're going to segment that out in their reporting and i think that this is primarily a developer initiative so that we can onboard lots of software engineers um, to build on aip and hopefully get those network effects of AIP now going because all these developers are absolutely going to be able to publish uh, apps at some point. Most of them will be free to start, but at some point they are going to be able to um, publish apps and get those network effects going and getting more and more people brought in. So this is a huge, huge deal. And it also shows that Palantir is not a consultancy. Their technology is real. It works just like any other SaaS provider. It's just in the past, for whatever reason, they've chosen to ignore this part of the funnel and only focus on this part. Now that may prove to be a brilliant long-term strategy. I have never seen that really work uh, for, for startups in the past, um, you know, but for Palantir, it may work out really well because this is actually the really hard part of this funnel and companies usually spend a very long time being able to work their way up to enterprise. They're already there, right? They have a premier enterprise offering. So filling this part of the funnel, I think that's gonna be a lot of fun. I look forward to helping trying to get developers uh, onboarded. And again, look forward to the next episode. We are gonna definitely jump into computer vision on GPT-4. We're gonna show how we can parse our SEC filing on there. And you software engineers are gonna be psyched. You can absolutely transfer all of your existing Python skills and Spark skills over to Foundry. It's built on the same underlying open source technology and you're gonna love it. So I'll see you guys in the next video.